Hello, everybody. Welcome to our ESGE Wednesday webinar. Today, this is a special webinar because uh, we start a bit earlier. And the reason for this is it's a bit longer. And the reason for this is we have a highlight, the highlights of ESGE days. Today, the best of ESGE days with the live endoscopies. And uh, it's really a pleasure uh, now to, to welcome the, the both bosses from the centers from London, George Webster and Thomas Rush, who did a fantastic job. And also welcome to all the endoscopists. Majority of them are uh, um, joining us this evening uh, for the webinar and we can lively discuss the cases. And uh, I think uh, we can immediately start with our uh, cases. As said, um, ESG days was in April now, uh, we are now in the preparation of next ESG days, and it's always a highlight to have the, um, the uh, live endoscopy uh, review. We start with a couple of selected cases, and George and Thomas selected for every center about five cases. So we will show you today the 10 most important, interesting cases, and you can discuss with them lively. Please use the uh, Q&A function. And Thomas, welcome. Thank you for yeah um, supporting ESGE at the center. I mean, Hamburg is is very famous as a ESGE or as a, a live endoscopy center with the Endo Club and other live events. And uh, Hamburg did a fantastic job. And yeah, well, now the floor is Hamburg. Please start with your first case. Hi. So we try to live up uh, to the expectations. We start um, upper GI tract, then lower GI tract, and then pancreatic biliary. That's the plan for today. And we jump right into um, the first case. That's an echolasia case done by Alana Ebigbo and Yuki Werner. A primary treatment of echolasia type 1, uh, long history. And here is the video. What I'd like to show you now is the poem, but a short tunnel poem. There is a very recent study published by um, Pietro Familiari um, and the Italian group around Guido Costamagna that um, <clears throat> investigated a short tunnel versus a long tunnel. So in this case, I need a short tunnel 8 to 10 centimeter length. And you can see here, we are already at the GE junction. With this is a triangle tip knife, knife with a jet flush function. And, and an airbed uh, vial three with um, spray coagulation. I prefer to use spray coagulation current to perform uh, these um, procedures. So I'm exactly- do you, know that you, do you know that you do the, the tunneling under the supervision of Professor Inouye? Yes, um, <laughs> I'm quite nervous, I must say. Especially, I hope to visit uh, Professor Inouye um, in July, so. Okay. So I, I am at the uh, stomach side of the myotomy right now, and I'm very carefully not going any, any deeper because I can see the very thin muscles compared to the GE junction, the thinner muscles of the, um, of the um, stomach side. So, um, so now just brief, briefly show the um, GE junction here. It's nicely opened now. Um, I... I'm quite happy with the um, with the with the um, distensibility of the balloon. The distensibility index pre-interventionally was 0 0.8. The distensibility index now is about 2.3, 2.4. Now you can uh, uh, switch to the endoflip, please. Endoflip. Yeah. So yeah. now you can appreciate um, the opening, the increased distensibility of the balloon. Okay, um, that's a short summary of the case and the poem is well established. There might be a few open questions. The first one is not even listed here. So um, I wonder whether Yuki has joined us in the meantime. And Yuki, can, us, can you give two bullet points what we need uh, endoflip for, the distensibility balloon? Hi. Well, yeah, here yeah. we are. Hi, Yuki. Uh, the, the endoflip, um, we can do it at, in during the um, 
sedated patients and it might be it can be have a prognostic um, marker for the uh, clinical outcome of patients um, when we use it uh, intraprocedural, for example, for the midterm, there are some studies um, uh, for the midterm clinical outcome, for example. So we could say for the initial diagnosis, we still need high, res uh, high resolution manometry, but then for follow up, maybe instead of x ray, um, the endoflip could come into play and save the patients some of the unpleasant follow up uh, manometries. Is that true? Uh, probably it will be in the future, yes. Yes. Alana, I listed a few things. What we know, a poem as good as Heller, better than balloon. Uh, is reflux an issue? So what's your main area of concern for yeah, poem thank, for the years to come? Yeah, thank you. I think um, the major point for poem is choosing the right patients um, for poem. That's point number one. And point number two is um, providing the patients with enough information um, to um, have sufficient informed consent. In my opinion, and uh, from the data which you showed um, in uh, you and Yuki showed in the New England Journal um, um, study, POEM is as good as laparoscopic hellas myotomy and POEM is even better in achalasia type three. I think this is um, this is clear. Poem is better than one session of pneumatic balloon dilatation. Yes, um, but but pneumatic balloon dilatation improves in um, uh, efficiency the more pneumat after two or three sessions. I think this point also has to be made. The issue of reflux is very important, and um, the data shows that at the beginning. Um, there is more reflux in POEM than in laparoscopic Hellas myotomy, but there are two points to be, to be made here. Number one is it's usually um, um, grade A or grade B reflux, which is significantly more. I think the more severe forms of reflux, there may not be such large difference between POEM and Hellas. The second point also, maybe you can comment on that or Yuki, um, perhaps with time, the uh, issue of reflux um, levels out between the two procedures. Yeah, Yuki, um, you, you have an overview on our long-term results. Um, do you think that uh, at five years uh, it's equal? So as much reflux in Hellas as in POEM? Um, well, we uh, saw that they, they appear to um, Get get getting equal, but I think uh, there will be a little gap between them. Yeah, yeah, it's still Alana. It's still a ten percent, fifteen percent, and it's very variable what you measure: clinical, uh, endoscopic, pH metry, etc. So these are not consistent, to be honest. But maybe picking up one one statement of you, Alana, and asking Yuki, what's not the right patient for poem? A mean question, so maybe I should give it to Alana, but uh, maybe the two of you could uh, a brief comment, Yuki. Yeah, I think uh, patients with uh, very uh, long-standing sigmoid um, uh, echolasia uh, it might be difficult for poem. Um, yes, yes, exactly right. I agree. Although such patients uh, are probably also difficult with all other procedures. Okay, Thomas, time is running, but may, maybe a last question to, to all of you. Who should perform a uh, poem? I mean, we started, Inoue was training you, Thomas, you trained me, I trained Alana. Uh, in the meantime, everywhere is poem uh, uh, obviously performed, though. Uh, which centers? Is there a limit? How, how, how long does it take to learn poem? Brief comment from maybe from the master, from Thomas. Oh, it's very simple. It's a classic elective procedure. It's a classic procedure for a high volume center. And the only thing which stands against it is uh, politics. Uh, we had the, uh, the patient organization of Echolasia two weeks ago in our center, and we were asking this question. Is it really a problem if you have an Echolasia to, you know, go 400 kilometers uh, to a specialized center? And the uniform answer was no. 
Okay. Well, so I think we have, we have eight minutes. Uh, I checked the watch, so we go on <laughs> and save one minute. We're okay. right in time, and we continue with our, with your second case, which was yes. a, a Barrett case. And Barrett, not Barrett again, but here it is. Um, sixty year six year old male with a high grade by biopsy. That's sometimes uncertain whether that's really um, a high grade or cancer. And uh, this is not artificial intelligence. This is human intelligence measure. Okay. The right side is a very discrete lesion, which was biopsied high grade, so I marked it. And now if we switch to endoscopy, actually we can't see it anymore because, uh, you know, here there is an injection and everything, So, but we have done the marking. And uh, during this short session, I would show a few principles uh, I already started. We, in the esophagus, we usually using the tunnel resection technique. So we circumcise around the lesion. Here you see the upper margin, the upper margin, and then the left side I already started. And then the plan is to go around on the other side. I started here. So the first dissection, I have to dissect all the way along, alongside the markings. And then I meet the distal resection which is here. Okay, I think we you have seen all enough ESDs from start to end. Sometimes uh, Endo Club uh, should have been renamed ESD Club. What I want to focus on is that in the esophagus, our life has been made much easier with the tunnel method. And this is a very nice schematic drawing from Guido Schachschall, where you see you have the upper incision, the lower incision, and then you go along the sides. So you have the specimen, and then the, the thing we learned from POEM is to go underneath, uh, form a tunnel with the endoscope, and then pull the specimen up that it doesn't fall down when we go on the sides and do like the two remaining bridges. And I think this has uh, converted ESD from a terrible, bloody, uh, messy procedure to something with uh, some kind of overview in the past year. So this is then the final shot alongside from one side to the other. So uh, we were assuming that this um, on this side, the left side, this uh, 2AC lesion was high grade dysplasia. Actually, in a, in a large specimen, it's not always easy to see where it actually was, but it was not cancer. So everything clear? Well, there's the ongoing discussion ESD versus EMR. We could spend the next two hours, especially if Helmut gets involved. But maybe my first question goes to uh, Torsten. How do you stratify your patients? Uh, do you still do EMR and which lesions? So well, thank you very much, Thomas, for this, this question. So um, uh, yeah, we um, meanwhile, we um, assess the patients, of course, be, before. So we did a lot of EMR, but meanwhile, we do a clear assessment of the patients. We look for um, lesions that show high suspicion of uh, submucosal invasion uh, as a good indication for unblocked resection, especially if we have lesions larger than two centimeters. So if we have um, cesar lesions or lesions with uh, that show a depression in the center, then we would uh, certainly go for unblocked resection in most of the cases. Um, uh, ESD, uh, if they are larger lesions, uh, and all uh, lesions that show clear malignancy and are larger than two centimeters are also a good indication for ESD. And of course, everything that has been previously treated with uh, where we can expect a lot of scars. So maybe uh, in the future, there will be a tendency to go more for unblocked resection. However, for large resections with uh, dysplasia, still EMR, piecemeal EMR is still a very good option. So is cancer the borderline, the cutoff, or? Submucosal invasive cancer and cancer. That's for sure, but uh, we never know. Yeah, and cancer, uh, and cancer uh, uh, larger than um, uh, maybe two centimeters uh, that you can, can't get it on block, yeah. I think we, we have guidelines from the ESGE and also from DGBS, and I think I, I can live with this guideline. If it's histology, not proven cancer, and it's slower dysplasia, and the majority is upgraded after resection. So um, piecemeal EMR might be an option. Um, there, there is definitely the risk for 
uh, over treatment if you perform always ESD. On the other side, we show that it's quite difficult to, to discriminate or to differentiate a mucosal cancer from a submucosal cancer. Uh, and this is, I think, still a challenge as long as AI is not possible to help us here. Even experts have problems. So I realized that in Germany, more and more uh, centers uh, uh, increase the numbers of ESD and are in favor of ESD of, of block resection. And uh, yeah, for small lesions, smaller than 15 millimeter, I agree, uh, the, the cap resection is still safe, uh, fast, cheap. <laughs> low CO2 footprint, um, but for um, the, the remaining lesions, larger one, I think ESD becomes more and more attractive. Okay, so EMR almost forbidden. That's an expected answer from you, Helmut. Uh, allowed for I didn't low say grade. it. I didn't say it. <laughs> it's your interpretation. For, for, for low grade, it might be allowed, but this brings us to... <laughs> to another issue, of course, we I, we leave that discussion. I can promise you we have a very interesting no, paper. Takes too much time. Very interesting paper to be submitted soon, so then we can uh, resume yeah. the discussion. So, yeah. which ablation? Maybe that's not a big discussion point because it's for larger areas RFA first. When is treatment finished? Hmm. Positive biopsy for because we want to eradicate everything. Positive biopsy with a normal endoscopy for hmm. Barrett. Yeah, maybe we have to change. Usually, our aim was uh, since uh, in the last decade to er eradicate everything, every intestinal metaplasia that we can find, even those that are only shown on biopsy, even though um, uh, endoscopic impression was no Barrett anymore. But uh, if we see uh, uh, or look across the border into the Netherlands, we uh, he hear that. Uh, um, maybe um, less is more, so um, maybe we uh, should overthink what we are doing quite uh, right now and should um, um, not ablate everything uh, and um, um, maybe survey some patients, but uh, we should also um, stop surveillance at a certain point, but um, there will be some studies coming from the Netherlands that may answer this in the future. So I realize that less is more doesn't apply to ESD versus EMR. But uh, anyway, um, last question to Alana. Um, so treatment is finished, no Barrett. Um, surveillance, how often? And uh, the Dutch people don't do biopsies if it looks endoscopically normal. So what's, uh, what's your policy in Augsburg? Um, that, yeah, that's a good question, but um, I think that uh, such patients um, uh, need to remain under uh, surveillance. I don't think that they can be dismissed, um, um, and I would still um, see such patients um, even after com complete um, eradication of, um, of Barrett's, because there are also um, there is also data that shows that um, even though less is more. There are some patients that still develop um, some uh, form of late onset um, uh, recurrences. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Our record holder is 16 years with high grade after many, many normal surveillances. But I think time is up. London is next, right? Yeah, we stay, we stay with ESD topic and move to London. George, you had a nice case. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, great to be part of this. So um, our first case, 73-year-old man with gastric atrophy and a two-centimeter lesion in the, in the antrum. And this case was performed by uh, my colleague, uh, Matt Banks, uh, supported by Janine Van Hooft. So uh, this is a new Pentax system. It's the Inspira stack. Um, and the new scope is the uh, IC or I, I20 um, using LED technology. Uh, the image is just really very bright. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but the, the, the first aspect that really strikes you is you can see the sort of cobbledy uh, uh, impression uh, within the antrum here. I've already marked the lesion. I'll talk to you about that in a second. And you can see areas of pallor areas where it's slightly raised um, and you can see a demarcation line where it's normal here and if you just see it starts to, to, to become paler I'm going to put eye scan on straight away and you can see these 
darker patches of intestinal metaplasia and the paler patches of atrophy. And it's really very clear yes. to I see here, isn't it? Inject. So I'm cutting away from my field of vision. I can switch and then cut towards my field of vision, which is actually probably better. Okay. This, this, this cut is where things go wrong yeah. because you're you don't know how deep you're cutting, so you just try and take it as superficially as possible, and you don't want to cut any of the deeper vessels either. No, because I think that's one of the problems in the stomach. It's well vascularized. That's about right. You, um, so I'm going to cut round here and then finish off here. So injection needle, please. So I release... Um, always make sure there plenty, there's plenty of room between the dots, um, so always round the dots. Um, as you've seen, you can see the pallor, this is an atrophic stomach, um, and there was a, a lesion in the middle. Uh, you can see here it's ulcerated in the center, uh, raised edges, um, and uh, there's a second lesion just at the top here. So if we put eye scan on, what we look for is we look for a demarcation line. You can see that the mucosa here has become, it's lost its architecture, the vascularity is disorganized, there's a demarcation line. So on the edges you've got abnormal but reasonably organized mucosa which is high grade and in the center you've got this uh, intramucosal carcinoma. Um, and if you look underwater, the beauty of using the cap here, you can see how beautifully the, the margins are, are defined. And then if we go a little bit lower, we come on to the main lesion here um, with a central ulcer. I'll try and look at it underwater if we can. Come away a little bit. And you can see the center of the lesion is, again, lost its architecture, the vascular is abnormal. Um, and then the center is ulcerated. So we estimated this lesion to be about two centimeters with an ulcer, just fits into the expanded Japanese criteria for curative resection. And the lesion above, uh, again, is very small. So that should be no more than uh, an M3, uh, as um, we've done here. So use gravity as your, 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 your guide as to your direction of dissection. I'm going back onto normal uh, imaging here. By the way, this, this Pentax, the, the quality of the imaging is just astounding. Um, this is a new I-20. So what I'm nearly done here is completed uh, dissection. I've just got to join, these, join this incision here around the lesion. It's really important to take it away from the pylorus. It extends right up to the pylorus. If you don't release this tissue, then you'll obstruct your views. If you look at the flow of the, the fluid, it goes up to the top. So we know that gravity is at about 10, 11 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to, my, my direction of travel is to release the right side and allow it to flop up um, and use gravity to your advantage what so you get under using which needle? So this is, this is an Olympus dual knife um, uh, inject. So it's got, uh, this is the dual J in particular. It's got, a, um, it's got a port through which you can inject into the submucosa. So I'll, you need a little bit of, um, so I'm just going to now inject. You can see how it lifts the submucosa. If I look here at the margins, it, it looks really okay. It looks it like does. to really lift and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's lifting very nicely here. I'm just going to diathermy these vessels. Could I soft coag, please? So, so we are happy with the lifting, uh, though we're less happy with these vessels we can see over here. So we're going to coagulate them. So soft coag, 100 and effect 4, just to, just to diathermy these vessels. And as with, you know, the usual logic, you diathermy both ends of the vessel, as you would do with a bleeding vessel. Okay, uh, good. Happy with the base? Okay, uh, rough net, please. Great case. Uh, yeah, a lo lovely case. And, and there's the, the histology, uh, uh, clear margins and um, uh, intramucosal moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. Um, so, um, you know, I, 
I don't do these procedures. Matt, you're a real expert, and there are others uh, on the panel who are real experts. It seems to me that we could talk all day about the brilliance of, uh, of ESD in removing this lesion. The thing that concerns me, and I think is probably backed up by the data, is that these lesions are missed by general endoscopists in day-to-day -day practice. And, and um, Matt, maybe you first. How do we avoid that? How do these cases get diagnosed such that they can come to you and Alana and, and, and uh, Helmut and others and be resected endoscopically? I think the first, um, thank you, George uh, and panel for inviting me, um, uh, Thomas Helmut. Um, uh, you've got to remember that these glandular carcinomas nearly always, 99.9%, .9 occur in the context of chronic atrophic gastritis. Um, and if you if you find initially that someone has features of chronic atrophic gastritis, the pallor, the slightly bumpy appearances of intestinal metaplasia islands, um, then you can then focus in on trying to look for um, early cancers or neoplasia. If it's a completely normal stomach and there's no atrophy, then the, the likelihood of non-cardiac cancer is extremely low. So it's these patients to target. And we know there are other risk factors being obese, smoking, um, and the pathogenesis is nearly always related to Helicobacter pylori. Um, so once you identify and you're aware of the features of chronic atrophic gastritis, and there are plenty of modules um, uh, to um, uh, learn the appearances, then you can focus on the cancers. And like in Barrett's, you look for areas of change in color, depression, uh, slight elevation, uh, any of those little subtle telltale signs that will point you towards um, neoplasia um, or an ulcer, which, which obviously you know, a lot of them that come my way already ulcerated, which is why they're picked up in the first place. So I think vigilance and uh, knowledge. We're not quite there with AI yet. I mean, as you know, the AI modules for Barrett's and squamous cell carcinoma are getting better, but at the moment the the, there's, the, the AI is is very much behind the curve when it comes to um, uh, gastric cancer. As you uh, okay. we discussed uh, in the Barrett EMR versus ESD, uh, we have the guideline for the stomach. Do you see any any indication for an EMR in the stomach, or could we conclude ESD is the gold standard for every kind of lesion? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. And, and how much, I suppose it really depends on resources because not every center does gastric ESD and, and, um, you know, particularly in, in the incisura parts of the lesser curve, um, towards the fundus, some gastric ESD can be really complex and difficult to do, even when you're using band retraction techniques. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think, uh, you know, as you, you're probably aware that the UK guidelines suggest anything smaller than 10 millimeters, if it's not ulcerated, can very safely and effectively be uh, uh, resected by an EMR, providing it's high grade. Um, uh, the problem is, is if you don't stage them properly, and in fact, there is some intramucosal carcinoma, or in fact, you, you, you haven't assessed the borders accurately, and it turns out to be an R0, R1 resection, it's much more complex to then go back and release all of the fibrotic tissue. So I think if you are confident it's smaller than a centimeter and uh, high grade, then uh, a CAP EMR is usually sufficient. Everything else should be an ESD. And yeah. any Matt, certain, you, yeah. Matt, you mentioned staging. Um, uh, you know, what about staging? You know, should we be, you know, if we see a suspicious lesion like this, there's a temptation to send the patient off for an EUS or for CT or for PET. Um, is, is there a role in, in this sort of lesion? Um, only if you are working that for surgery. Yeah. But okay. not not for ESD, the, the endoscopic staging techniques, if you are familiar uh, and you you know what you're looking at, uh, more accurate than doing an EUS or CT or PET. So uh, those techniques should really just be reserved for surgery as, as, as is in the guidelines. 
Okay, and 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 yeah. Lana and and, and maybe uh, um, uh, Helmut, you know, this patient, as Matt has said, has got a cancer within a field change of diffuse gastric atrophy. Uh, how should this patient be followed up, both in terms of this, or how would in Augsburg, for example, would this patient be followed up in terms of their resection, and then uh, subsequently uh, in terms of surveillance? Yeah, I think the first point is um, you, you should confirm it's a um, curative resection, then uh, H. pylori education is necessary, and then the follow-up every year. And depending whether it's an expanded criteria or it's not expanded criteria, usually uh, receive a in the follow-up of a CT scan, uh, but not necessary in the guideline criteria. This is what we suggest in the German guidelines. And this almost similar to the Japanese. Great, thank you. Um, great, uh, great discussion. I think we're probably yeah. time for the next uh, for the next case. Thank you. We are now moving from the stomach to the duodenum, and then we leave the upper GI. And the case number four is again from Hamburg, and Thomas will present this case. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, we have two minutes, no, three minutes over time, but uh, we try to make it up. Uh, you have heard there is a, a large group of ESD maniacs. Uh, now comes the smaller group of cold maniacs. A uh, 77 year old female where somebody uh, else would try to tackle a dude in Ladenoma, placed a clip and uh, then had to stop. Uh, here you see the dude in Ladenoma. I, I'm working with a Fujifilm endoscope and um, a gastroscope. Um, if you have a duodenal adenoma, you should check the adenomas for suspicious features. I'm not a pathologist and not uh, very keen to really analyze this to the end. Also, if you have other features like BLI, the bile is always red, so I like to stay here. And the extension of the adenoma is up to here, half of the circumference um, of uh, adrenaline. The bloody spot is where the colleagues outside was, were working a little bit on that adenoma, which is uh, usually making our life a bit more difficult. You have seen that the lifting was not as brilliant. So here I go, I press the snare, it's pretty flexible, I suck a little bit too, and then try to cut. Also here, the principle is not to, for Hendra's principle is not too greedy. Mm -hmm. See? So if I can't manage, now, be patient. And what you see here is this uh, little fibrous blap. So there have been studies uh, showing that uh, this is not residual adenoma. And, um, here you see it looks a bit more messy than with hot initially, but at the end I hope I can show you that um, it looks nicely at the end. This is the fibrous part. Um, I would like to convey two messages. I've shown you a snare before, which was the standard snare, very flexible. But here I am at the area where the colleague tried to treat the lesion. And that's a message to your colleagues, please, if you want to make our life easier, don't touch. And here I want to show you a second snare, which is the maybe the salvage snare. It's maybe a little bit stiffer, but um, so I catch this scary area. At least I try. I push down. Then I suck, close. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. No, 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 it's close, but don't, don't pull. So I got a little piece, and then you see this metal sheath, which so you can exert greater force. I pull back, and Heinz <coughs> pulls back. Yeah. Zack, yeah? Extending yeah. the cut, or uh, margin coagulation also. So it's getting the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. but at the end I'll spend probably most of the time, here's a little piece to really yeah. look at the margin, and here's a little piece to make sure, at least macroscopically, that the job is done. OK, so this is before and after. It was all low-grade adenoma, although you could say, oh, there are these glossy areas in between, and maybe, and so on and so on. So cold resection. 
we have shown in a retrospective study um, it has a much much lower complication rate so yeah. if you know i extrapolate the esd maniacs i would say it's unethical not to use uh, cold snare in duodenal adenoma yet alana you're doing a randomized trial why Thank you, uh, Thomas, for giving me the floor to introduce uh, the topic of the prospective randomized control trial, because we know <clears throat> that um, EMR, hot snare EMR for large duodenal lesions is extremely um, tricky because the risk of bleeding is far above 20%. And then you also have the risk of perforation. So uh, you have uh, shown in a retrospective um, trial that um, the risk of bleeding is extremely low with cold snare resection, as low as zero to maybe one, 2%. Did, um, did this patient have a bleeding, Thomas, the next day? Yes. He had bleeding, really? He had bleeding. He was, no. <laughs> yeah, there, there's never zero. This is the reason why we had this follow up. Not, not, e not even in ESD, there's a zero rate of something. Okay. Uh, so, bleeding. of course, it bleeds occasionally, but then um, uh, probably yeah. in much lower frequency. Yeah. Exactly. So, this is exactly what the, um, the primary objective of their uh, prospective randomized control trial is trying to show. Because I think there's one thing which could be worrisome uh, in the colon. The current yes. randomized trials, when you speak to the people, I mean, it's all scientific gossip yet, but the, the assumption is there could be a higher recurrence rate, mm -hmm. at least in adenomas. Mm -hmm. And my gut feeling, my duodenal feeling is that um, this could be the case here as well. So yeah. uh, I think in reality, and at least in this case, a uh, randomized trial is warranted. Maybe but let's ask other people what's in, in daily practice. Henrique, uh, Hope has joined. So do, do, what, what do you do in your daily practice? Still hot and hope for a lower recurrence rate or have, have you started with a cold snare resection? Um, yes, hello. Um, no, we really um, are doing more and more uh, cold snare resection. And uh, we also um, found that uh, the bleeding rate in our clinical routine is, is a little bit lower. Um, although, as you said, it looks a little bit more dramatic during the, the procedure. I mean, Thomas, you, you said, well, from retrospective studies, we know the bleeding rate is lower and we expect a higher recurrence rate. Um, I, yesterday I came from Brussels and Marc Barté had a huge, a circumferential uh, uh, duodenal adenoma and we were discussing hot or cold. Mark said, well, I will do hot because if you have a recurrence rate in this circumferential lesion, you have no chance to retreat it. And that might be a problem of, for the future. I would speculate that depending on the size, the smaller one are ideal for um, cold snaring, but the bleeding rate for the smaller one are also less. And for the really big one, um, this problem still exists. Would we accept more bleeding or would we accept more recurrence rate? What is your thought about this? Well, I think the strictures are terrible with hot as well. Um, and this and is a classical, is another problem. <laughs> it's a classical endoscopic discussion. It's based on weak evidence and assumptions. So I think I can only really support Alana and everybody who is listening. Please join us in this randomized trial. It's really important. And if it's large yeah. enough, etc., we have it's probably a differentiated outcome. So maybe lower complication rate, higher recurrence rate. And we have then to go into subgroup analysis, but let's be a little bit more evidence-based. And I, I think that uh, Amrita Sethi has got a, a question on this as well. Yeah, Amrita, hi. Uh, hi, Amrita. hi there. Hi, thanks for, for, for having me. I, I just wonder um, how you think this may change with the use of closure methods and topical hemostatic agents. Because if you can decrease time, uh, decrease um, bleeding risk and decrease recurrence, um, would that argue for uh, combining hot EMR with use of adjunctive methods? Potentially, yes, but you know, all these, these agents are also the classical field for assumptions. And unless we have a randomized trial, especially in bleeding, no way to conclude anything. And closure of larger defects is difficult. If we have better devices, there might be question mark again, higher stricture rate. So we have just to figure out and uh, please observe your cases, record them. And even a good retro retrospective study 
is fine. Okay. So we have eight minutes. Should we make up one minute, Helmut? Go I think on. We should continue. One question Great. before we move on was yeah. from the from delegates uh, from, okay. from the attendees about the role of APC in. Ah, uh, yeah, I see the question. Um, any role in what? The role Primary. of APC in reducing, uh, well, they don't specifically say, but in reducing bleeding, reducing recurrence, do you think there's any role here? Oh, if you want to have more perforations, no. you, should, you should apply <laughs> APC on the resection side. No, not in the duodenum. There is there we go. uncontrolled Good. data from yeah. Michael Burke saying that the recurrence rate is, is decreased also in the duodenum. Yeah, right. I would not recommend APC in the duodenum as well. Okay, then let's continue with the next case, and we are moving now to the colon. And Charles, yep. it's your case. Yeah, so continuing the challenging cases. So this was a 73-year-old man who had a three-centimeter lesion at the cecum, identified on a screening colonoscopy, um, and the hope was to attempt uh, 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 or to perform piecemeal EMR. Uh, and resect this lesion, performed by Brian Saunders with uh, Ed Seward. Uh, let's show the case, and then uh, Ed is here to discuss. To, uh, I my name's Ed Seward, I'm endoscopy lead at UCLH, and I'm joined by uh, Professor Brian Saunders from St. Mark's. Uh, we got a, uh, a gentleman who had a bowel cancer screening uh, colonoscopy last month, and this showed a 30 millimeter polyp in the cecum, which the endoscopist tried to lift, uh, but was unable to, uh, he was worried about tethering and so that went through our polyp MDT and we made a decision that we'd reassess the lesion with a view to possible underwater uh, EMR. It's so the Pentax right. colonoscopy and we're using the, uh, the discovery system uh, on the AI. There's a little polyp up here, all this, and you can see if we just scroll through the different modalities, this is iScan 2, we go to iScan 3, there's a little bit of uh, movement, but you can see typical little adenoma, Ed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with uh, typical meshed capillary network. You can see the vascular structures nicely. Um, so this is going to be a, just a simple cold snare to remove it. Lesion. We've got a much bigger lesion coming back uh, here from the cecum. But he's actually got an anal stenosis, so it was a bit tricky getting the cap through the anal canal. So we, um, we decided not to use the cap. So this is the main um, lesion, um, quite subtle, um, G-type LSL, um, there's no prominent nodule, uh, at first sight appears very benign. I'm going to just go up the, uh, the eye scan modalities and you can see this would be a nice type 2 JNET 2A lesion. Uh, but it's a, so we're not a fraction, fraction too big for on block. Uh, and it's in the cecum in an older patient. So I think I'm going to do a conventional piecemeal EMR on this. I, I don't think on block excision is necessary because there's nothing of concern about the lesion looking at it. I think we'll do it. So we've, we've started the, the uh, resection of this polyp. It's putting a little bit awkward in the, in the corner of the uh, cecum. So we've just taken it off a uh, little bit at a time. We've tried them in different positions, and whatever position we go into, gravity is not terribly favourable. Just take that bit stuck down just at this point here. Didn't, didn't lift quite so well. So it's just changed over to a smaller snare. Ah, you're not stupid, so it's interesting, even in this, uh, even in the left lateral position, it's still <laughs> on the wrong side. So let's try him over on his right again. So just and, and this is a real world situation, isn't it, where the um, uh, you do have to go through the options. I mean, certainly using a, a cold snare which is nice and stiff Open. can sometimes be a good way of managing uh, uh, a polyp oh. base that you're really struggling to clear. So really basically, you, one always tries to start at one point and work sequentially across the lesion, but here it's been tricky for a number of reasons, a, a spasm, um, it, the access is poor. So I basically just tried to, where there's a, a, a where we have good lift, take take that, and then move across the lesion. But um, it looks very stuck down just at this point in the center, which is tricky. Moderators, uh, and uh, let's break for 15 minutes, and then uh, we come back. Bye-bye. Okay, um, so, um, 
you know, all of us in our practice or uh, and uh, including when we're doing live endoscopy, want to do beautiful, perfect procedures that turn out wonderfully. Um, and, um, you know, actually some of the best learning comes from when, when that is not possible. And clearly um, this was a, a really challenging case. And, and um, uh, Ed, um, uh, you were you know involved in, in the case, um, you know, clearly very challenging. Um, what um, a couple of questions really? What's the next step for this patient? We know the histology that was taken was all low grade dysplasia, um, but um, you know we a complete resection wasn't uh, uh, wasn't possible. Um, what's the next step, and what have you learned from this procedure, and and what would you teach others in terms of assessment and? Uh, what to do in the situation of uh, things not going 100% to plan. Um, thank you, George, and um, thanks to the panel for inviting me along uh, today. Um, yeah, I think this case raises uh, a couple of interesting points. The, uh, we have a way of assessing the relative difficulty of uh, polyp removal with the SMAS score. So size of the polyp, uh, the morphology, what's it look like? Um, the access, how easy is it to get onto the polyp uh, and the site, whether it's right or, or left colon. And this polyp scored pretty highly across those four um, uh, categories. So this is always going to be have the potential for uh, being a, a challenging lesion. But what it teaches you really is that attached to the polyp is a patient. And in, in this particular case, it was done under conscious sedation. So patient was actually quite uncomfortable throughout the procedure. So that was a struggle. Access was difficult. The scope kept on falling back. And so maintaining the, the endoscopic position was, uh, was challenging. And the lesion, whether it was due to the prior in instrumentation or whether it was just due to fibrosis, as a polyp moves back and forth in the fecal stream, it can develop fibrosis. It had become stuck down and tethered. So so removing it, all our plans to either try underwater EMR or ideally on block resection all, all went to nothing. So in terms of what we do as the next option, uh, number one, it's uh, propofol um, so that uh, that then stops becoming a concern and that should help with access. Uh, number two, we then got two options, either an underwater EMR or um, endo rotor, and actually we we we've decided to go for endo rotor in this particular case because it's a low profile polyp, mm -hmm. so we're not dealing with a big lump of polyp uh, that would take all day to chisel away with the endo rotor. So in his particular case, um, we will at least try the uh, endo rotor. But I think underwater EMR is also a perfectly acceptable uh, answer, and particularly when there's been try prior. Uh, uh, instrumentation. Uh, the, the reason we didn't end up going for underwater EMR in the first case is just because it's a sequel lesion and there's always an anxiety about causing a perforation. And you've got to balance risk and benefit. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, Helmut, would, um, you know, it, clearly it's always easier when one is observing. It, it, you know, the, we focus a lot in endoscopy about uh, when to proceed with a procedure, but any advice you would give to the endoscopists who are watching on on when to stop and how to stop? Because it's it's very difficult when one, one has embarked on a resection like this to say, okay, now we we pull away and do something different. And, and in your practice, what would you uh, do differently coming across the difficulties that we, we saw? Um, yeah, th th thank you for this, for this difficult question. I mean, this is daily life. Uh, we, we get images from colleagues and they were, patients were sent for, for a resection. And then you, you realize the, the, the difficulties in the stable position of the scope or whatever, as in this case. And sometimes, really, I mean, what, what I really recommend is if somebody has a feeling he's not able to resect this lesion, he should not start. He should send this patient to a center. 
Uh, if you are in the center, like it was already at the center. No, if you are in the center, like in London, as in this case, um, even in the in in expert centers, you have a a, a a a chance, a risk that you will fail, and then you you have to discuss with your patients. Say, well, I think it's an indication for an operation. It depends on the location. I mean, in the cecum, it's totally different to the rectal lesion. Rectal lesions, rectal surgery is quite difficult. I would say I'm not a surgeon, but I discuss with this patient what are the options. I mean, uh, Ed, that would I would like to ask you: uh, When will you con have a control now on this patient? And 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 as you said, you will start probably with underwater. We have some experience. Other made the data are published. If you have not a complete resection, to combine it with full sickness resection, if there is a, a small piece left which cannot be resected with, with EMR, with ESD, because it's too fibrotic. So we still have, but the question is, how long will you continue if you fail the next time? How often can we uh, try to, to resect this kind of recurrences? Or it, it is not a recurrence, it's still visible. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really uh, interesting point. And I, the answer, of course, is it depends. And uh, uh, having a, a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy is a much easier prospect than than having an anterior resection for a rectal lesion. So, yeah. so I would have a lower threshold for asking a surgeon to help me out on the right hand yeah. side of the colon, where an operation is so straightforward yeah. and so so safe. But it's yeah. it's it's also you obviously have to take patient factors into account and and he's certainly game for one more at least one more go and so okay. we'll um well but, ed uh, we'll, we'll have to have yeah. a a follow-up to the follow-up uh, webinar and you can tell us how we get on next time. yes I, yes uh, i will this show a, you the successful video this Great. is a challenging and i think case, we're next um, case and, and, and thank you for presenting this wonderful case you're welcome right. thanks ed um and i think we're next case we must move forward unfortunately despite we have so many discussions. And I think, Thomas, it's... Okay, you, uh, speaking of difficult cases... From the cecum to the rectum. Speaking of difficult cases, I'm very surprised that underwater is the solution for many things. But anyway, um, and we have to, to admit that we were giving Torsten a very difficult time. Sorry for that. With a recurrent rectal adenoma, low grade where the primary ERCP was already complicated with some kind of clinical perforation not seen on CT. So, uh, Thorsten, we owe you. Let's see what we find here. We are here in the distal rectum, and you can see here a lesion in the 6 o'clock position. It's nicely located here, 6 o'clock. Um, you can, can see it here uh, quite nicely. And if I advance the scope a little bit further, you can see here uh, a scar. Of course, not only for studies, we want to know which, uh, size, which size the lesion has. So, of course, we can estimate, but this new scope is equipped with the new scale eye system developed by Fujifilm. And this mm -hmm. is use, uh, can be switched on using, um, using uh, this button. This is, uh, uses a laser technology. Hello? Are you back, are you back you with are us? Online. Yeah. So meanwhile, we we, can uh, see you. Ma we managed to uh, do a circumferential incision, but we had to deal with a couple of very heavy bleedings. Ausfahren bitte, okay. And then below the lesion to make it now easier to get below the lesion, okay. Well, um, we just wanted to show you what we did in the meantime with this uh, very difficult ESD. We had to face a lot of bleeding and uh, a very scarred uh, submucosa without any visible layer but in the end we decided to apply a little bit of traction so as you can see here we put have put a clip here with a rubber band and the uh, um, uh, end uh, the distal end of the of the lesion and put another clip here in the perpendicular wall of the uh, of the rectum okay tough case nice images but um indeed at the end, um, I think ESD is one option, but we are not going about, you know, it was a low-grade adenoma. We are not going about um, oncologic aspects. Uh, it's about recurrence. And uh, we have ESD maniacs, cold maniacs. Anybody here who is a full thickness maniac? 
Thorsten? Uh, so we, um, uh, I'm uh, uh, very much a fan of the full sickness resection um, uh, system that uh, has been introduced several years ago. However, in this particular case, I uh, think it would not be ideal to treat this lesion because it was too big. And because of all the scarring around, uh, I um, would be in doubt if we could have pulled in the entire lesion uh, in, in this cap. So maybe a uh, um, hybrid te uh, technique with EMR and full thickness in the center would have been an option. However, um, uh, yeah, there, uh, I, uh, as always, there are different ways to skin this cat, of course. Uh, uh, and ESD was one option, but it was really tough, to be honest. Right, um, so we have this German randomized trial running, full thickness versus conventional. I think in the full thickness uh, arm, trimming is allowed, right? So you could decrease the size of the lesion. So you select the most central and scary part. What's your experience um, with full thickness in, in scarry lesions? Well, what do you do if you can't pull it in? Then you have to go back to ESD? Yeah, so um, sometimes it ends, uh, it could end in a mess because if you have the resect the surrounding part and then grab it, uh, um, the center part with the snare, and then you are inside with a uh, full thickness device, then you try to resect. Um, and uh, uh, if you try and have the impression that um, not everything is inside, then you have to come back and remove the clip uh, that can, um, uh, after some, some weeks, this is sometimes difficult. So um, in, in the case when you cannot really pull it in, I would uh, then uh, come back and uh, um, do not um, perform full thickness resection, remove it, uh, and then try to um, uh, do snare resection. And then maybe also other techniques like uh, uh, um, uh, hot or cold avulsion com in combination uh, with um, uh, maybe also uh, this is a good indication for endorotor as, as it was suggested in the previous case. Okay, so we have a we have a lot of weapons, but don't know which to a use. Question from from the chat yeah. uh, is uh, underwater in this case. Rectum. I think underwater is not the solution for everything here. So um, uh, underwater depends on the ability to um, uh, create this. Pseudo polyp or something like that, and uh, I think this yeah. would not be possible uh, in the rectum and also in this scarred uh, uh, area. But yeah. maybe I'm I wrong. Think, no, I, we, we wouldn't do. We do a lot of oh. water, but not in the rectum. I mean, I, if this lesion is in the colon, I think full thickness resection is nice with a uh, Ovesco clip device. In the rectum, why not doing a full thickness like the surgeons? No. Uh, this can be really safe and then close or not is a matter of debate. The surgeon wouldn't close. They straight, would straight go forward to, 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 to resect it and even leave it. Yeah. And, and I think we as gastroenterologists, we should think about this technique in the rectum because rectum is, is definitely completely different from, from the rest of the colon. And we have different options and different risks and different complications. Okay, guys, it gets more and more confusing. We now have 10 methods on the table. Uh, and, and we have to move and forward. Cold and, well, so what would be a reasonable way to start this recurrent adenoma? Maybe let's go back to Thorsten. The best. Yeah, so uh, I think the way that, that was uh, planned for this patient was a good one because uh, uh, risk for, um, as Hamilton said, the risk for complications is very small in the in the rectum, and so we did our best to um, remove it. However, we we should do a follow up and then uh, uh, see what what comes comes after that. So I think you have scheduled um, a follow up for this patient and. Uh, uh, I would be, um, I, I don't know, I have not seen the histopathological results, but it's slow, uh, it's low grade, no great. And uh, I don't know if it was complete or not, but um, well, one, one lateral margin was not 100% uh, free. Okay, so but, but control in six yeah, months. that will be fine. Yeah, I think so the was, next option would be what we have been doing um, in these cases, right. apply argon beamer afterwards, you know, to prevent recurrence. This could also be discussed. 
but uh, so we have time till 32. We can save another minute and go on. Yeah, but before we go to the next case, we should avoid this recurrence. And I know you can't hear it, but I wouldn't do a piece milliamma in the rectum. I would do ESD and then you don't have this trouble. Okay, Helmut, there is a randomized trial in the colon. The recurrence rate is 1% for ESD and 5% uh, for EMR. So EMR is not so bad. Well, I think we can we can move on to an area where there is no yeah. debate between EMR and ESD. <laughs> Very good. Love that. <laughs> that sounds good, to Josh, before we yeah. just discussing about ESD and recurrence. Yeah, yeah. So, let's um, move forward. Uh, some, we, we've got some good uh, uh, HPV cases. First one, 61-year-old man. Uh, this is his eighth ERCP for biliary stones and probable Maritzi syndrome. And uh, the procedure was performed by uh, Amrita Sethi. So straight into the, uh, the case, please. That is at least one, possibly two stones in the root of the cystic duct. Um, which causes intermittent obstruction. Um, but uh, now, and Rita, uh, there's nothing to do here, is there? <laughs> what well, are we doing I, here? I think we have a little work to do here. We, um, we've taken this cholangiogram, if you can see that on the fluoro. Interestingly, we don't see the takeoff of the cystic duct, really, which is where mm. we were suspecting might be the problem. So um, we're using and the so Exalt uh, 2.0, as well as we'll plan to use We did see on his yeah. MRCP, his most recent one, it looked like two stones sitting in the cystic duct still. Yep. And, you know, so really it's very difficult to tell in this situation. Um, so once I have this connected, I'm going to use the dials of this cholangioscope to kind of take that upward direction. A little tension on the wire. So actually, so yeah, <laughs> incidental finding. So yeah. we found the cystic we found the cystic duct. Yeah, exactly. Um, talk about direct visualization of the uh, cystic duct. It's a very low insertion. It's a very low insertion. It's probably why we weren't filling it with contrast. Would you say that a real challenge here is going to be getting into position in that very low inserting cystic duct and getting the um, the electrohydraulic lithotripsy probe out. Absolutely. In a very angulated position. This will be. Uh, epithelium, it really yeah, look abnormal. So, so I, I don't think Amrita is ever going to return <laughs> um, because we had presented a nice, straightforward uh, Maritzi syndrome case here. But in fact, it's quite <laughs> clear that this patient's cystic duct uh, comes off about uh, Less than a five, maybe 10 millimeters above the papilla but, but you can see the stone there she's done an absolute brilliant job we're just being very careful the issue is as you know always with ehl and laser lithotripsy the reason we do it under direct visualization is to not damage that um duct and i have no room left to really oh, that's good that's good um it's a very limited ability to deflect up to, to actually touch the stone um, because if I withdraw I'm going to fall out so you do see a little bit of damage but what I'm basically doing is almost making it blind and, and lifting the probe or yeah. torquing so the probe is pressing I think right behind the back of the stone okay great oh nice oh, here we That's go nice. here we go nice I mean I think here if we can tackle the more proximal one we will but it's probable that the more distal one was the one causing all the mischief. Yeah. And if we can just get, we'll get a wire under direct visualization up there and see if we can't use the balloon. We may need to And dial. so you can see that the cystic duct is now clear. There is a stone right at the top of the cystic duct that yeah. has yeah. never caused a problem and almost certainly never will cause a problem. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, an absolutely outstanding yeah. procedure, mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah, okay, so um, uh, great case, uh, Amrita. Amrit, I hope you've recovered from it. Um, uh, just a couple of questions. I mean, this this patient had had seven ERCPs at a at a good at a good um, at a good site. Um, and we saw on your initial cholangiogram, you know, we ourselves were saying, well, where's the problem here? There does not seem to be an obstructing stone. Um, and, and I suppose a general question is. When should we, with difficult stones, be considering either, either to perform cholangioscopy in our own unit or 
of particular relevance, when should patients be referred onwards? Because we certainly see, never mind Maritzi syndrome, we see patients with bile duct stones who have had one ERCP after another, and it was perfectly clear after the first procedure that there was never the slightest chance of clearing the stones with conventional ERCP. Yeah, that's a great question um, and great case. And I, I, I want to know whether the patient was completely cleared of their pain to answer that. They uh, were. They were. Pressing. Very good. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think when we, there's a couple of times when we really should go straight, I think, to cholangioscopy, for example, is when um, we're dealing with a more narrow uh, distal duct, um, and it's just not going to be possible to dilate up the duct enough. Um, you always want to respect the anatomy. Um, so if there's a, a dilated proximal section, or if you see that the stone is really impacted um, within the wall, I think those are situations in which struggling with dilation and trying to get a basket around it is not going to be um, helpful if it's at the, you know, the um, cystic duct orifice, I think those are ones in which <clears throat> you're, you're really not going to get around it with a balloon, a basket, and just applying um, uh, introductal therapy, um, I think would be good. The other situation is when the anatomy is off. So I don't, if you remember in that case, we were performing the procedure from the stomach. Um, yeah. because the it was a very difficult position to maintain, even for a standard ERCP, we were sort of falling out, but certainly using the, the spy. And I think in those situations, um, rather than struggle with, you know, maintaining baskets and balloons and getting the right types of forces, those are ones to, to really think about um, using cholangioscopy. Yeah. In terms of where sending it to a center, I think it is important um, when you recognize that early, that cholangioscopy should, uh, and this type of stone management should be treated in centers that um, do this at a high volume um, with, you know, uh, therefore higher chance of clearing it in one session, um, potentially decreased uh, risks of complications. Yeah, and when we think about costs of cholangioscopy, well, you know, one perhaps can massively reduce the overall health costs by introducing uh, uh, at an earlier stage. And I suppose the other thing is that in years gone by, with such a difficult position in the lower duct, the, the earlier versions of, for example, the spyglass cholangioscope, we would have felt that we would never be able to maintain stability. Um, and as you say, you were, I mean, it's a testament to your expertise, of course, but you were maintaining uh, um, a stable position, actually, for the cholangioscope in the very distal duct, even when the duodenoscope is in the gastric antrum. Um, and I think that the manoeuvrability of the, uh, the the present generation cholangioscopes is is allowing us to do that. Um, uh, so great case. Um, I, I uh, have a last question, George, to both yeah. of you. It's a more political question. Um, because of the safety of the procedure, is it or in your country, you do a lot of outpatient treatment. Is this a, a treatment for an outpatient or would this patient be treated in your hospital and stay overnight? Yeah, uh, well, certainly in um, we've moved increasingly. The way that our practice has changed is that all of these patients will have their procedure done with uh, uh, either general anesthetic or under anesthetist administered propofol. So that's a practice change that is... Uh, you know, we haven't reached completion in the UK, but that's certainly something that we do. Um, but not necessarily. I think that um, we would recover these patients for a number of hours in the department, um, but we would not, um, by definition, plan to admit them um, uh, to hospital afterwards. I don't know, in the US, in New York, Amrita, would, would you do so? No, I, I think it's primarily outpatient. Um, I agree with all patients. Okay. All patients are done with general anesthesia. They all get antibiotics if they undergo cholangioscopy for uh, about three days or so. But um, most of them are are discharged or, or just done as outpatients. I think if there's concern for potential cholangitis or you know complication, but, then there's the no reason I was asking because in Germany our healthcare system does not allow now these patients to treat as inpatients. So we have to change our policy. And we can okay. learn from UK and from US, obviously. 
Okay. okay. So thank you. Thank you both. And then That's um, great. Thanks, Samrit. And, and then uh, case from Hamburg. Yeah. Thomas, you're back. Okay. The OCP case. We have CP case. We have a special disease, primary sclerosis in cholangitis, which is or should mainly be done in centers. And Henrique Lenzen from Hanover did this case, um, a 33 year old male, repeated dilatation. And um, let's go to the short video. Um, on the imaging um, with the yellow circle, there is a um, high great stricture of the left hepatic duct with a pre dilatation. And um, here you can see the common bile duct, uh, which, which is a little bit uh, enlarged and a little distal narrowing ring. You can see the cystic duct and we already um, um, cannulated uh, the left hepatic duct, which was a little bit difficult, but uh, without uh, really giving contrast, uh, it was uh, we were able to, to cannulate um, to cannulate the duct, we we have a pressure of 12 atm atmospheric pressure, and we keep the the balloon now in place. And I'll ask uh, Maren to to gently uh, increase the pressure. Mm -hmm. Now you can see nicely. Okay, um, specialty area, Henrique, but still I think um, there's another plea to do this at centers. My feeling is that uh, the ERCP in these cases can be tricky. The first ERCP has a higher complication rate, pancreatitis rate. It's not always documented in the literature, but it could be. And also my impression is that a stricture is different. So if you fail to pass the stricture, the longer you try, the worse it gets. So what, what are your tips for the ERCP? Uh, what information you should have before to start with? Yes, I, I totally agree that um, PC patients um, should, uh, should go under um, endoscopic um, evaluation in a, in a center experienced with the disease. And I think what is really important that uh, you need an imaging before um, doing the ERCP. And um, it, it, it is suggested to be MRI with MRCP. Um, some are doing ultrasound um, in, in very good centers, but um, you have to know previously where the stricture is, what you're doing, if there is a suspicion of malignancy, so that you can really plan your ERCP. Um, so so to, to summarize, no primary ERCP or no ERCP without MRCP. But there are also quite quality differences between MRCP and MRCP, right? Exactly. Um, and um, therefore, a lot of work um, has been done um, with the ESL and ACLD um, guidelines recommending um, um, definitions and nomenclatures uh, using um, MRI and MRI protocols. Um, and this has been uh, published recently that we harmonize the, 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 the MRI procedures and the protocols within and using, for example, contrast if you have a suspicion in malignancy and um, this, this in order to, to increase the quality, um, really we have done it. But we all know that we also have a problem with um, with the availability of, of the MRIs, um, which which is a challenge, of course. So so the message is don't do ERCP everybody in a patient with suspected uh, PSC, whatever that is, send it to a reference center, and then things will be organized, starting with a high quality MRCP. And what we are going for, and you mentioned it in your live presentation, is a dominant stricture. What what's that exactly? Yes, I mean, this term has been introduced a while. It's, it's a biliary stricture on ERCP, and this term should only be used um, in ERCP, and it's defined as a stricture with a diameter under or equal 1.5 in the common bile duct or under one millimeter in the um, hepatic duct. 
But to make it more complicated, uh, recently uh, within the guidelines, ASLD and ESL, a new term has been introduced, which is the relevant stricture, meaning that we are adding a term of clinical relevance with it. So there we have the definition of a stricture with, with signs or symptoms of obstruction or, um, or um, bacterial cholangitis. So you should also use in your report um, the, the word relevant stricture if, if you have the signs and symptoms. Okay, wait, wait a bit. You, you, you said um, this is a ERCP term and not a MRCP term. Did I get that right? Exactly, exactly. So which MRC, which MRCP, MR, yeah, sorry. Yes, MRCP is high grade stricture. And because we do not have the filling pressure in MRCP, um, the, the word dominant stricture, which was really randomly um, defined, and, and there has been lots of discussions in the community about this term, this term dominant stricture should only be used in ERCP. Okay, so, so we do I, MRCP, we don't have a high grade stricture, no ERCP then? That's the big question. We don't know if we have clinical symptoms like um, jaundice, pruritus, weight loss, or a rise in liver enzyme, then we would do, um, of course, ERCP. But, and if the stricture is worsening as well, but we do not know really if treating strictures without any symptoms is of any, um, any help and, and bringing liver um, outcomes like uh, transplant-free survival um, in these patients um, um, to, 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 a good, um, to a good way, to good success. We don't know that. Okay, but, but getting back to that point, if you have a um, MRCP without a dominant stricture or high-grade stricture, you wouldn't do an ERCP or if the patient is sick and jaundiced, you, you give it a try and don't believe MRCP? Yes, that, I mean, it's, a, it's an individual case basis. Um, if, if the stricture is, for example, in the extra hepatic uh, bile duct, I think there are good data in, in, in doing an ECP. If it's purely intrahepatic, we don't know if there is a, um, is a benefit. Um, but of course, um, if there is um, a clinical symptom, um, we would uh, we would do ERCP, and we we were in the last years a little bit more progressive in doing ERCPs. Okay, maybe one one point because we have one minute left. A question to George: Surveillance for malignancy, lost metal, cholangioscopy. What do you do? Uh, yeah, I mean, we great question. We know these patients have a uh, such a worryingly high risk of uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Um, we um, we follow them with imaging, usually on an, a, an annual um, an annual MLCP and with CA nineteen point nine, with all the 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 reservations about CA nineteen point nine. Um, we I don't we certainly I don't think anybody follows an, an endoscopic surveillance program. But you know I do wonder whether you know over the next uh 10 15 years whether we'll change that we know that the other disease that these patients have is colitis we know that they have an enhanced malignant risk and they have you know these patients with psc and colitis have annual colonoscopies to look for mucosal lesions um we are increasingly confident about performing safe colangioscopy um the imaging is getting better we aren't there yet, but will we in years to come find that there is an organized um, program for cholangioscopic surveillance? Uh, we're not there, but you know, I do think that it, uh, it is something we really should be looking at over the next few years. It's a nice summary, and 10, 15 years is a good period for a long-term study, I agree. <laughs> so, yes, okay. thank you, Thomas, for this great cases from Hamburg, and now we move for the last time to to London with the last two cases. Great. Uh, we're a bit out of time, but I think Thomas, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, take, yeah. take your time. I'm no, 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 we're not going to take our time. We're going to oh. talk about an 87 year old man um, uh, with uh, biopsy proven gallbladder cancer uh, and hyla stricturing. Prior to his pathological diagnosis, he had plastic stents put in, and we were proceeding in this case to bilateral 
uncovered mesh metal stents. There were two plastic endoprothesis placed, which were actually really uh, effective as his jaundice uh, subsided. But now we want to go for a uh, long term uh, treatment. So today we're going to place metal stent. Yeah, that's the wouldn't, A. Uh, ordinarily need or expect to use the cholangioscope to uh, get into the, the, the ducts, but it's a great tool to have. Um, we're using the uh, Pentax deck duodenoscope, which has a detachable single-use cap. The, this is where the, uh, the lesion is, um, obstructing and separating both the left and the right ducts. Okay, so we've got wires in the left and the right, but we are just going to delineate that a bit. So let's inject some contrast. Screen, please. There we go. So we're showing quite nicely where these strictures are. And as this is quite, you know, have to do really Screen, teamwork please. that your nurse is pushing in the wire. And in the meantime, we're taking out the endoscope. Yep. That's stable. very good. And as and you can see, we choose two different type of wires so we can differentiate between the left uh, and the right. Okay, good. Stop there. And now, uh, stent selection. We've uh, elected to place uncovered mesh metal stents here. Uh, we can't place fully covered because we're across the liver hilum. And we're going to use here the uh, Cook Zilver Stents, 10 centimeter by 10 millimeter. Right. The advantage now, the of this stent, one of the advantages, is that um, uh, it has a six French delivery system. What that means is that uh, hopefully we can insert both delivery systems at the same time uh, uh, through the working channel of the duodenoscope and therefore deploy at the same time and avoid the uh, issue of uh, having one stent deployed and then not being able to pass the other stents uh, beside there, it. Bernice. Working so very closely with Bernice, because of this crisscross wire, bit of tension, she is able to be sure that her wire is staying in place. Back a little bit. Beautifully back. So you, back you a see bit. here about your communication, and bit. George Stop. is really, really having a ah. short communication with his nurses, which is very no, important. Fine. Let it go. Let it go. Screen, please. Okay. Uh, very good. So now, uh, we're ready to deploy now. Important point, these stents are said not to foreshorten, um, but they're not resheathable. Um, I am, uh, we're going to start deploying, but the most important thing is that I am across the liver hilum. I want to bring them out into the duodenum, but if these stents are not quite long enough, it, it's, it's not the end of the world because we could overlap. Nice. Okay, but, good. So, so let's start, start deploying there. Okay. Good. And now uh, we're going to go left, right, left, right, about a centimeter time. So uh, left. Nice. Nicely across. Keep going, guys. Left and right together. Left and right. Yeah. Okay, stop. Nice screen. Nearly there. Okay, stop there, screen. That's very nice. Which one is this? All the way. All the way. Wow. And there we go. I Good. would say a big applause for the nurses, eh? How nicely yeah, they did it work. together. But great and work. Trexy, fantastic. So thanks very much, guys. I might actually. Yeah. I'm going to overlap a stent. Uh, I into the bottom end, just so that we've got access in the future to that other stent. But I, I we're happy. Oh, okay, perfect. good. Let's uh, start deploying. Just go. Perfect. Done. Nice pick. Nice shotgun at the end. That's what we want. Uh, okay, so um, good out good outcome in the uh, uh, in the end, um, and um, we've got some uh, good ESG guidelines that anybody can uh, look at to um, uh, to really um, understand the, the 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 rules around um, uh, stenting uh, the liver hilum. Um, just uh, welcoming my uh, colleague Gavin Johnson, who's also uh, online. Um, Gavin. Um, you know, we see these patients, you know, week in, week out. Um, give us some of the crimes. You know, there are real crimes that can be committed um, in terms of hyla stenting. And, and, you know, what would you say those are and, and, and how we avoid them? Hi, good, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, you, you prepped me on this question, George, and I've made a little post-it note of crimes. And then I've just seen that slide for the first time. And they are seven excellent crimes which has slightly stolen my thunder but essentially 
essentially we, we need a tissue diagnosis. So um, once you've decided that, you know, the intervention is required, we need to know the etiology of that stricture. And we, we've used the expression in the UK about getting it right first time. So I think waving a brush and a speculative ERCP isn't good enough anymore. I think with plangioscopy available, optical diagnosis, uh, direct targeted biopsies, uh, possibly EUS, although biopsies of proximal strictures are a bit more contentious if the patient's operable. But if, if they're not operable, then you might bring in EUS to get tissue depending on the clinical situation. So that's the first thing, you know, refer it to a center and, you know, try and reduce the number of procedures these patients are needing. And number two, as, as summarized beautifully on that slide, is having a really detailed plan for drainage. So this means an MDT discussion is cancer likely. If it's cancer, is it operable? If it's operable, which sides do we need to drain? If it's not operable, how best to palliate left, right, uh, right anterior, right posterior, et cetera. And then you can get into whether ERCP will deliver that outcome best or whether you're going to need percutaneous or very often both. Um, and of course, up our sleeve in the palliative setting, for left sided drainage or bridging stents from the left, depending on duodenal access, is an EUS guided hepaticogastrostomy. Um, yeah. And don't stick a stent up speculatively, even if you think it's malignant disease, because we've all had our finger burnt with lymphoma and IgG4, we might get two or three referrals a year from other centres. So no uncovered metal stents across the hilum until you're damn sure it is, uh, you know, for palliation of confirmed uh, malignancy. And, so that's it. But that's Gavin, may I ask yes, Thomas, what, uh, Helmut, what is the, the role of RFA before standing? Yeah, um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, I think that the two roles for biliary RFA, um, one is uh, at the time of primary stenting, uh, and the other is uh, in order to help recanalize um, uh, tissue ingrowth into previously placed uh, uncovered metal stents. Um, the use of RFA, biliary RFA, is not standard in... in uh, in the UK, I know that I think it's used more in Germany than elsewhere. The well, we have we have a randomised trial which showed no benefit. So that was my question yeah. to UK: Do you do you use really RFA? I mean, yeah, no, we, we do we, it a lot, but meanwhile we are a bit disappointed about. Yeah, is it worse? To, there, was, there was lots of excitement about its oncogenic properties and heat shock yeah. proteins, but as you yeah. say, I think the latest RCT was negative. I think there's a role for rescuing blocked stents. Um, okay. perhaps not the evidence, but certainly plenty of anecdotal experience of that being very useful when you when you're running out of space in okay. in patients who've survived quite well with uncovered stents. Okay. And and uh, and Rita, the um, you know we all love endoscopy. We think that uh, endoscopists rule the world. Um, but but what about malignant hyalur obstruction? You know, when are the scenarios in your centre or or more generally? Uh, when should endoscopy Endoscopists be taking on these cases. Uh, when should they fall to the uh, the interventional radiologist? There was obviously a, there was a study, quite a small study from from the Netherlands a few years ago now, which was stopped early because of increased mortality um, in the patients undergoing uh, a radiological approach. Um, but you know, is there is it more nuanced than that? Who should be tackling? Um, highly malignancy when it comes to uh, biliary stenting. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it all really does depend on who your local expertise is. Uh, I think if you have good EUS guided experience, that has really, um, I think, taken the role for avoiding IR procedures. But uh, that, with that said, um, you know, I think there are some cases clearly when it's uh, on the right side, um, it, it needs to be um, drained. It, combining uh, IR procedure with um, an endoscopic procedure, I think, it, is good too. I, it really comes down to expertise, I believe, and there shouldn't be uh, politics involved of, of you know, who's going to. Shouldn't be. Well. Shouldn't be, but often it. The, the often often is. And I mean, yeah. you know, just a comment that I would make is that. You know, selective duct cannulation is is one of the things that, you know, can be a real challenge with ERCP. And, you know, I do think that cholangioscopy has a role here in, in yep. achieving selective cannulation and um, yep. uh, a crime that, uh, yeah, is on that list that Gavin didn't mention, but we, we certainly feel very strongly about is 
very, very detailed uh, assessment of the cross-sectional imaging before proceeding. Nothing worse than people diving in um, and, and whacking stents across the liver hilum without a clear understanding of which segments to get into. And cholangioscopy can have a role for selecting those ducts. Um, yeah, and I think I the think nice, the trick that you showed with the wires of being able to even cannulate to two ducts through cholangioscopy and, and um, you know, use that. I think that now that we have that available to, it really demonstrates its utilization. Great. Okay, okay. I think we just move on to the next case. We Last actually, case. Pretty George. well for time, pretty well yeah. for time. 64 year old man with morbid obesity uh, and uh, acute cholecystitis um, uh, and Gavin um, accompanied by Amrita uh, did his EUS um, gallbladder lamb. So let's go straight into the case. Assessment to see if he does uh, have stones in the CBD, possible ERCP, but also most importantly to do EUS guided gallbladder drainage because the surgeons feel that he is not a fit candidate for surgery. And so we'll uh, go over to Gavin. Um, we're using the Olympus scope. Uh, it's the GF UHT 260 uh, linear echo endoscope and I'm in the duodenal bulb and coming on to not that distended a gallbladder. Don't forget this has now calmed down in terms of being acutely infected. But there we have the gallbladder, so still in bulb. In so our intention I think he's going to be better served with a hot axios drainage um, and go back at another interval when we have a mature tract between gallbladder and duodenum to go through the stent, maybe deliver some EHL lithotripsy and clear the gallbladder that way and ultimately remove the stent or leave some plastic pigtails through the fistula. Okay, so I've got my 19 needle down. This looks more likely on a US here. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, so look, put all of that contrast in. Stop screening. Yeah, fill that with contrast. My like EUS views are so shot that I might be relying on the fluoro view to deploy the distal flange of the hot axios a little more than we normally would. And we're now getting a nice cholangiogram as well. And for that, you don't want to overfill the gallbladder with contrast because you'll, you'll lose your, the view of your stents as you deploy. We've got a much better view than we had, right? We've filled that. The, the stones are a little bit more dispersed. Yeah. And you can also see that the gallbladder is closer to the duodenal wall, um, which is something we want to think about in terms of the size of the stents. This is a 15 millimeter by, by 10. Um, and this is where we see the trajectory of my stent. So we're going to, I've also got a preloaded hot um, Jaguar halfway down the hot axios device here so that when the distal flange is deployed, I can get a wire in, it will salvage maldeployment and I can do a coaxial uh, double pigtail stent. So we're on um, our axios settings, which is auto cut effect four. Just move those um, lines. Move the suction. 100 watts. Nice. So we're in. We get that nice smoke. We're going to lock wheel one. We're going to take the lead off if we can. And I'm going to deploy the distal flange. We can check by fluoro very screen. quickly. Screen. You can see the catheter is nicely all the way inside the gallbladder. And there we see the flange on EUS as well. Yep. That's a nice view. And now we're coming back. We're going to take the catheter just touching and changing the shape of the distal flange here. At this point, I'm going to pass my jag wire. There we are, a bit of, bit of wire in. So our coaxial pigtail will be ready to go. And now final stages. Once again, that's locked. And a triple maneuver of deploying. And this is a width the within the scope deployment, which and is nice pushing and out safe. And talking clockwise. And there we have on the. If we show your endo view here really quickly. If you just really flip to endo. And now we're going to exchange over that wire. And we can screen. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, yeah. so exchanging on the, on the uh, jag wire. So we'll bring the patient back after um, a few weeks just to make sure uh, once the fistula has been has granulized and then actually try to do some stone therapy, remove stones, um, do EHL if necessary. And once the gallbladder is cleared, um, I think the hope is to actually remove the stent in this case. Okay, um, very, uh, uh, very nice. And uh, 
uh, guidelines related to um, the, uh, the from the ESG related to um, my, my first lab question training. would be how does the patient do right now? Sorry. Yeah. So no, an, a, an update on this. Yeah. An update on this chap helmet. His his gold, uh, his bile that was heaving with stones as well. So it, we actually did an ERCP off air afterwards, and pretty much cleared his duct with a, a sphincterotomy and a sphincteroplasty, and uh, left a pigtail in the bile duct as well. Now we hope to get him back before now to get him sorted with an update. Uh, he's actually coming back next week. He went on holiday for two weeks just as we wanted him in. Uh, I've spoken to him once. He's got my email. He's been absolutely brilliant. And what he has certainly reflected on is that he's probably been been living with rumbling attacks of biliary colic and cholecystitis for God knows how long, in fact, uh, as one would expect, because his gallbladder and bile that were completely full with stones. Uh, so it, just as the plan has remained the same, we will um, we'll probably do a, a, a stick a scope through that 15 millimeter hot axios into his gallbladder. I wouldn't be too surprised if a lot of those stones have have come through already. The larger ones may need some EHL, um, and I expect his biliary tree to be clear. So we would leave him uh, hot axios free and bile duct plastic stent free at the end of his follow up procedure. But clinically, clinically well with those stents still in. Now, now, uh, Amrita, in in years gone by, if he went on his his holiday, he will have gone with a bag hanging out uh, the side of his abdomen. Having had a um, you know percutaneous cyst gastrostomy uh, put in by IR, which would need to stay in for six weeks or so, do you think that um, you know EUS gallbladder lambs is uh, you know has it completely replaced, um, if available, the the role for um, percutaneous cyst gastrostomy, or is is it more nuanced than that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the caveat to this answer, of course, is it's dependent on that you have the right expertise available. But I think there's really good data now, both um, systematic meta-analysis, as well as, as you see there, um, a well done randomized control trials that have compared percutaneous to both lap coli as well as to EOS guided and, and clearly show um, decreased uh, complication rates as well as recurrence rates. Um, in the the non percutaneous um, method, so I, th I think I think we are in a place where we can say that uh, EUS guided um, can replace it. You know, um, they're always going to if there's failure. Of course, you go to percutaneous. Um, really, uh, otherwise, the patient can't undergo sedation of any kind. Of course, there's still a role there, but um, I think the data is is very supportive. Okay. Um, so we've we've uh, we've run over not too badly, um, just by a little bit. Um, I think ten great cases with lots of good discussion. Um, I hand over to uh, Helmut to to close the the session. Thanks, guys. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, George. Thank you, Thomas, for this brilliant uh, job uh, for the live demo during ESG days, and now also for this excellent summary of the highlights. I really much enjoyed it and I hope all the uh, uh, participants. So I hope all you who joined this meeting, this webinar meeting uh, this, e this evening will join the next uh, weeks all of the webinar. However, there will be a summer break. Uh, you still can watch uh, ESG days on demand for two or three more days. And then hopefully we see you after the summer break and uh, latest next year, uh, for the ESG days uh, in Berlin, which is a Jubilee meeting. And for now, I would like to thank you for joining us. Thank you, Thomas and George again. And uh, thank you all the endoscopists, the faculty who participated. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. And, and Bye -bye. thank you to David and Gabi on the backstage who always did a brilliant job that uh, the technician. Uh, right, so well, thank you.